Well, my name is Marcus Bertone. I'm the California Opinion Editor, and we want to welcome you uh, to this meeting. It's a very straightforward um, process that we have. We'll begin with Ms. Yu, a two minute opening statement. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Yvonne Yu. I'm the first generation immigrant, mom of three boys, Democrats, and a candidate for state controller. I'm the most unknown candidate here. Unlike other candidates in this race, I'm not interested to use my controller seats as a stepping stone. I want to do what I'm good at, mm -hmm. which is finance. About my background, I have 25 years experience in finance, having managed my own investment firm with over 1 billion asset, performed numerous audits with SEC, NASD, and state of California. Like many Californians, I'm an immigrant coming from Hong Kong at age 16, a year after my father passed away. I still cannot forget the struggle my mother had raising three daughters on her own. I'm also a mom of three boys. As a mom and immigrant has shaped my leadership as mayor and now council member of the city of Monterey Park. I'm not a typical politician. As an outside financial expert, I'm good at auditing and interpret audit results. I read the city audit reports and immediately solve the biggest financial issue in the city. I saved the city over $55 million by refinance our pension obligation, secure all employee pensions, and be able to initiate another street bond to repair all the street in the city, saving another $20 million to $30 million in future repair costs. As your state controller, I hope we can work to safeguard our state finances fight for California to earn livable wages and live with dignity, utilizing mm -hmm. the latest technology to improve income and close economic gaps, and most importantly, to build education program to help California tourist economic securities. I did get John Chung's former controller and endorsement, along with over 70 elected officials. And most importantly, I have the 25 years experience, finance experience and knowledge to do the job. So thank you and look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to Mr. Glazer. Two minutes, please. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm a, uh, a seasoned state leader with a, a very long record of service here in California, but that record I think will show you that uh, I've had the courage and independence to speak truth to power and to stand up against powerful interests in my party, uh, or as we say, in the Capitol outside the building. Uh, but I, uh, I've worked for two California governors I've been a senior aide in the assembly and the Senate. I was the spokesperson for the chief justice of the Supreme Court. I've served in local government 10 years on my city council, including three terms as mayor. I served on the board of trustees of the state university. Got uh, 20 years on different various audit committees, including the joint legislative audit committee. And I've chaired five different policy committees in the legislature, banking, insurance, uh, general government, uh, business and professions. And I'm currently the chair of the elections committee. But despite that long record of service, I think you'll see, and I hope in the course of this conversation today, that you'll see I have a, a record of being an independently minded Democrat, progressive but fiscally responsible, uh, willing to stand up to uh, every, you can name it, an interest in this state, whether it's the business community, the labor community, that I've, uh, I've stepped into my responsibilities as a legislator with uh, a willingness to, to speak truth to power. I refuse to fill out candidate questionnaires. I don't think secret promises belong in our political system. I don't take gifts or travel from special interests. And I've also advanced a bipartisan agenda working on both sides of the aisle uh, to advance good public policy. Um, and I look forward to talking more about that record, uh, hopefully in the course of this conversation. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Galperin. Two minutes, please. Good morning. I believe that we're in a pivotal moment because trust in government is at an all time low. And I believe that that makes the work of what a controller does more important than ever. And I also believe that my work as controller in L.A. and the independence that I've shown is the best preparation for the job in the state. I brought a radical transparency to our city, which you can go and see at LAController.org, including our open checkbook, every account online, trackers for every dollar spent, dashboards measuring performance and results, and I'll do the same for the state of California. I've also been an independent voice for fiscal responsibility in our city to keep our finances strong. And my audits have been focused on changing how we do business, including most recently groundbreaking audits looking at housing, why it's taking so long and so much money to create affordable housing, how to do it more effectively, and how to use government owned properties among other things. I've also done a lot of auditing on the environment, on public safety, good government, equity and diversity, and much more. And I've got a very ambitious agenda for state controller to track spending in real time so that we can actually focus on doing performance audits, 
to dedicate the resources of the office immediately to dive into the billions that we're spending on affordable housing and on homelessness with mediocre results, to get the hobbled fiscal system working once and for all, to also use the powers of the controller and the statewide pulpit on the more than 70 boards and commissions on which the controller serves, to establish red teams to work with our cities and counties and school districts that need help, and to focus on equity, which is crucial and which I take very personally, being the first in my family to be born in this country and the first LGBTQ citywide official in Los Angeles. Uh, it is vital that we have a controller that has the experience to do the job on day one, and I believe I'm ready, and I'm very grateful for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now, Mr. Chan, two minutes. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Obviously, I'm the only one who didn't get the memo about being in a stationary place while we have this conversation, so I apologize in advance. Uh, but I'm Lon Hee Chen. I, I grew up in Southern California, actually where I am today. Uh, the son of immigrants from Taiwan, uh, had the opportunity to grow up in Southern California at a time when I, I thought it was uh, a really remarkable time to be a Californian. Um, my parents came here not speaking much English, but with a great dream and one that I'm very proud of and that I'm very proud of my family's story here uh, in, in California. Uh, I uh, went to pu public high school here in Roland Heights, which is actually where I'm driving through right now, and, uh, and then went on to Harvard, where I got four degrees, including my doctorate in political science. Uh, and from there, spent time in national policy making, working on tough issues like making health care more affordable and fixing Social Security. I'm one of the few people that's been appointed to high office by both a Republican and Democratic president, having served President George W. Bush, working on health care policy, and Barack Obama as a member of the Independent and Biosystem Security Advisory Board. Uh, after spending a number of years on the East Coast working on, on public policy issues, I returned to California with my wife, who's also a native Angelino, and our, and our then one child. We now have two kids, an 11-year-old and an 8-year-old. And I took an appointment at Stanford University and at the Hoover Institution, where I focused for the last nine years on questions of how we improve the fiscal policy environment here in California and beyond. Uh, during that time, I've also had occasion to uh, direct our domestic policy studies program at Stanford University. Uh, I've also started my own small business, which is focused on fiscal policy council. I've been the chairman of the board of my community hospital, including uh, a member of our, of our compliance and audit committee, looking seriously at questions of how we make our community health system better. I believe I have the experience, but more importantly, the independence to do this job well. And as controller, I look forward to being a truly independent voice for taxpayers in California and to sharing more of that vision with you as we go on. Uh, all right, so if uh, this is, uh, I will, I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Josh Golke, who has the first question. Hi everyone, I'm Josh Golke. I'm the deputy opinion editor at the B. Um, I was just wondering to start off since this position requires um, the, the person in the office to, to to do it well, it has to uh, go against the political establishment on a regular basis. And you're all, of course, uh, involved in politics in one way or another. Um, so I'm wondering if you could give us an example or two of, of your ability to go against the grain and, and show the kind of independence that would be required uh, of, of the political establishment. Um, and we can start with Mr. Galper in this time. Well, uh, when I first came into office, uh, I was uh, very interested in looking at the numbers when it came to our Department of Water and Power, which is the largest municipal owned utility in the nation. Um, we have 10,000 employees and they're represented by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. They are arguably the most powerful union in Los Angeles. Um, when they didn't get me what it is that I needed and what it is that I wanted to actually delve into the numbers. I asked for it. I asked for it nicely. Then I asked for it more insistently. Uh, when that didn't work, I served subpoenas on them and they sued me and they lost. They appealed. They lost. And uh, I had no problem in doing what was necessary to get the information that was needed. I bucked a lot of the political establishment, a lot of the democratic establishment, uh, I bucked a lot of the elected officials in the city who were very uncomfortable with what it is that I was doing, but it was absolutely the right thing to do. I would do it again. Thanks, Mr. Chen. Well, as I noted earlier, I'm the only one here who's actually served administrations of both parties, who has a demonstrated ability to work across the aisle. 
who has a history of working in a number of bipartisan projects on really tough and intractable issues, whether health care, as I noted earlier, social security, but also tax policy, budget issues. Uh, and, and I think the required independence from one's party is a crucial part of this role. Uh, I, I have also not hesitated to speak out uh, when there have been things in my own party that have dissatisfied me or things that I believed were problematic. And I've done that repeatedly in public. Uh, I have an extensive public record of commentary on all sorts of different issues that don't align necessarily with questions of party, but more questions of principle. And as I said, my own record, as well as my own experience, demonstrate the ability to stand apart from party. I think it's an important question. I think it's important to stand apart not only from party, but from interests, whether corporate interests or interests that are, uh, that are trying to seek to influence what's happening in Sacramento. And I have experience speaking out on the right policy. My background being in public policy, that's been the focus of my own experience and my own time in public life. Uh, Senator Glazer. I'll mention some examples, but let me just humbly say that uh, when I say I, it really is we, because everything that I've ever accomplished has been in partnership with many others. Uh, you know, I, I created an inspector general over BART, challenging the BART union and BART management over the strikes that have occurred in the Bay Area. Uh, I uh, uh, took on the, the teachers union on the issue of school district reserves when I first came into the legislature, they put restrictions on school district reserves. The teachers union most powerful interest here in Sacramento opposed the bill. We eliminated that or modified that school district reserve issue. I've taken on four year grad rates at the state universities against the faculty opposition. I've come out for a 401k option in our retirement system to make sure it's uh, it's t uh, properly funded uh, and, and, and maintained. I, I support public charter schools. I've uh, I, I voted against all the prison guard contracts. Uh, I uh, have uh, advanced a number of uh, bills uh, dealing with uh, mental health oversight. My, one of my bills is on the floor of the assembly. It's not been sent to the governor because he said he would veto it. So I, I, I've taken on power at all levels of government. I've got political scars across my entire body for that independence that I, I'm happy to illuminate even further. Uh, Ms. Yu. Yeah. Um, thanks for the opportunity. And actually, when I first got elected to um, the city council, I look at their book and review all the audits. I'm actually a ticker. I know how important it is for um, the finances of a city. And so I look at the that is the biggest issues that for the pension obligation and funded liabilities. And that will actually um, make the city bankrupt. So I quickly actually refinance the bonds and issue um, a $110 million pension obligation bonds to refinance it and save the city over 55 million and actually capture the lowest rate 2.66 instead of CalPERS charging a 7% of a balloon payment, which will kill a lot of the cities. So um, I look at it and the city staff were really happy that I can lead and um, um, you know, help them and advise them and take on the lead. And a lot of uh, residents actually asked a lot of questions. Are we taking on more debt? I said, no, actually we're refinancing and saving a lot of money. So um, I wanted to take the lead and to help more city. And I received a lot of phone, phone call from other mayors and asking for help as well, because not all the city can do the same thing. But then I wanted to do it um, at the right time and also capture uh, the best possible solutions and to help the city and to get out of, of the debts and also future bankruptcy. So um, in, you know, there a lot of people against uh, the issues and, and thinking different way, but then I think this is the right way to do it and ended up, you know, um, yeah, I save a lot of the employee um, pension. So um, I wanted to hopefully move up to California and look into CalPERS and CalSTAR and help them to see how we can actually uh, better serve the pension obligations. Thank you. What aspects of state, sp state spending would you target for more investigation and oversight and why? And let's begin with uh, Ms. Yu. Uh, sure. Actually, um, there's a, when I perform audits, usually the biggest funding um, will be audited first because we usually prioritize with the size of the funding. But then um, there's a lot of fraud like EDD and there's a lot of um, situations like the operating mm -hmm. uh, system that for a controller that we tied it on, uh, we won't be able to perform a lot of audit transparently. So I think the um, big, biggest priority is to actually upgrade our operating system to perform audits in a more efficient way. But you mentioned that you asked me about which targeted. So I think EDD is actually one of the 
um, the departments that we wanted to help and look into. And also, um, so pension, I think pension, um, CalPERS, CalSTAR is actually one of the area that I wanted to um, target it because there's a lot of um, policies, investment policies, and also um, a lot of the directions that is not um, the right way to do it and imply the situation to the mm -hmm. city and make all the city bankrupt. I think this is not uh, the right way to do it. And I, wa I wanted to actually target it and help uh, the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Glazer. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I mentioned the bill I have on the floor of the assembly that we spend 7 billion on mental health in the state and my legislation provided uh, uh, a pathway for more accountability and and how that money is spent. I certainly think that uh, we're going to spend uh, between 12 and 13 billion dollars on the homeless this year. Again, uh, I think a lot of frustration out there among the community about where is that money going and how it's being spent. But I have to say that when I think about things that are are equally important, if not slightly more important, I think about all the spending we we have in education. You know, we have 500, more than 500 failing schools in California today, and we spend almost no time talking about it, about what's going on and, and why and, and wherefore and what we can do better. So there's limits to what a controller can do. Uh, a lot of the focus in the office is on compliance audits, but it does have the ability to do programmatic audits. And I think that education is such an important, valuable thing we have going in our state. And in a lot of places, it's not going very well. And and so it's a place that I would have my attention to find the right way to try to examine how that spending is going, and particularly in the underperforming schools in our state. Thank you very much, Mr. Galperin. Well, there are audits and then there are audits. And what I mean by that is that many audits that are done are often strictly financial audits. And in the final analysis, they tell you something, but not nearly enough. And I want to focus very much on performance audits, seeing what are the results that we are actually achieving. Moreover, audits by their very nature are looking backward, sometimes years after something has occurred. And what I've done in Los Angeles is create that open checkbook so that every dollar we spend is online for everybody to see, searchable, downloadable, uh, filterable in real time, and also trackers for each and every one of these dollars spent and dashboards. And what this allows uh, everybody to do is to see how the money is being spent. And while I'm the watchdog, it allows other people to participate in that process as well. And that also frees up resources to really dig deeper from a performance point of view at how it is that we are doing in key areas. And one of those key areas, as I mentioned earlier, is relating to housing and homelessness. 12 plus billion dollars that is going to be expended in the coming budget year. And we have seen that the results are actually really falling short in so many different ways. And I plan to dive in immediately to look at how that money is being spent, how we can use it more wisely and more effectively. And lastly, I'll note that there are 6,000 jurisdictions that report to the controller's office in one way or another, be they cities, be they counties, be they school districts, water districts, even mosquito districts. And I want to create a platform similar to what I've done in Los Angeles, where all of these entities can plug in, and I know it's not a small task, but it can be achieved, and also have all of their numbers transparent and in real time for everybody to see. Thank you very much, Mr. Chan. I think we have to be systematic in our approach to, uh, to audits across the different programs of state government. And certainly it seems to me that one of the top priorities has to be to, to take a good hard look at Medi-Cal, which is a program that really has not been systematically audited uh, probably in about 20 years. In fact, if you look on the controller's website, the last systematic report issued on, on Medi-Cal was from 2002. Program's grown by 40% since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So we know that there's a significant challenge in terms of service uh, delivery and, and providing services. But there's also a problem on the provider side. You know, in, in 2019, um, the auditor of the state of California put out a report suggesting that there might be as much as $70 million in benefits being paid to dead people uh, via the Medi-Cal program. And that's just a snapshot in time, obviously, but certainly with respect to the program more broadly, it is such a significant line item of spending that it would be foolish to not begin uh, by looking at health care. I think the, uh, the earlier analysis on K through 12 is spot on. I think we need to look carefully at, at what's happening and the controller's office can certainly exercise a little bit more power on the bully pulpit side to emphasize 
areas where school districts, for example, are not complying with existing laws requiring the determination of uh, or handing over of information regarding uh, pay, pay and administrative and, and benefits information. Uh, and then beyond that, obviously, there are a whole host of other uh, programmatic issues, whether it's corrections, which is also a significant part of our budget, uh, the in-home supportive services program, which is another area that has not been carefully examined. A and then there are some which the media likes to cover, which are certainly interesting, uh, perhaps in dollar amounts lower, but deserving of some examination as well. For example, the high-speed rail a program is one where we know there are continual cost overruns as well as issues involving, involving no-bid contracting. So uh, I, I would take a systematic approach and I would look at it from the perspective of where our state is spending money uh, and, and be unafraid to do top to bottom regardless of program or interest involved. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, both of uh, two of you have mentioned public education. And I wanted to stay on that uh, for the next question. Uh, we recently had uh, a, a, an eight-day strike uh, in the Sacramento City Unified School District. Uh, the teachers' union secured um, substantial raises. Uh, currently, uh, uh, the Sac City Unified School District spends 93 cents of every dollar on salary and benefits uh, for union members. Um, there's currently a strike in Oakland. There's already been a strike in Los Angeles. In all of these uh, uh, instances, the teachers unions have attacked um, the, uh, the, the, the desire by the districts to maintain uh, appropriate um, uh, surpluses uh, in case of shortfalls. Uh, and uh, that, these are issues that um, don't really bubble to the top in, in communities who are you know, correctly uh, love their teachers, but but um, get confused on the issues, uh, and uh, and so I wonder if if the controller's office has a role to play uh, to counterbalance the 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 the, uh, the influence that CTA has on school policy and school finances, uh, and um, and so why don't we start there and we'll start with uh, Mr. Champies. There's no question, Marcus, that the controller can be an independent voice for taxpayers and an independent voice for constituents when, in too many cases, the California Teachers Association and, uh, frankly, other unions have had much too powerful of a voice, much too powerful of a role in our politics. Um, you can also point to the debacle in the Oakland Unified School District as another example of where uh, liabilities carried over time resulted in uh, school closures that are going to hurt families who can least afford to be hurt. Uh, you can't pin that entirely on the CTA. You can't pin it entirely on any single entity. But there's no question that in too many cases, um, the cozy relationship between the people in power and the CTA has resulted in significant challenges for policymaking throughout our state. So the answer is absolutely yes. The, the first step, of course, is the controller should ensure that any information that is required uh, that should be required, particularly around pay and benefits, is provided. You know, we all know that two thirds of more than that, three quarters of districts aren't aren't mm -hmm. complying with existing requirements in that regard. But but even more importantly than that, to get to real transparency around how K through 12 dollars are being spent. You know, the controller is the chief audit officer for the uh, for federal funds coming into the state of mm -hmm. California in excess of seventy five thousand dollars a year with a direct report to the Office of Management and Budget. And at this point, one questions where all the money that came in during pandemic relief associated legislation, all of the uh, all the legislation that we had over the last couple of years, we saw tens of billions of dollars flooding into California districts. Did it go to more teacher pay? Did it go to better facilities across our K through 12 schools? Uh, I would hazard a guess and say in many cases it has not. So it's important for us to be careful in examining not only state flow of funds, but also federal flow of funds, which the controller is certainly entitled to look at and, in fact, required statutorily obligated by federal law to look at. So uh, those are certainly areas that's a transparency play, but it's also using the bully pulpit to help uh, people understand uh, who is standing in the way of reform and being unafraid to point that out when necessary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Galper. Well, transparency, I believe, is absolutely key. Mind you, it is not the end goal in and of itself, but it is an absolutely necessary prerequisite to understand how the money is being spent and in many cases how it is being misspent. Let me say a few things on this. Number one is, as we know, too many of our schools are failing our young people here in California. 
And I think we need to look at what is the curriculum, among other things, what is the way that we are training our teachers, what are the kinds of education that we want to provide for our young people. The world has changed and is changing even more rapidly now. Moreover, we're seeing many of our school districts with declining enrollment. What does that mean for the future of our schools and our school districts? But as to the influence of a CTA, uh, it is absolutely crucial that the controller be independent. Uh, and I have been so in Los Angeles. And I believe that, by the way, every school district should put every dollar that it spends up online for everybody to see. And that will also allow, again, the controller to be an important part of that watchdog, but allow other stakeholders to do the same. And I think that we have to absolutely hold all the parties responsible, the teachers, the administrators, the school districts, the school boards, because the results that we're getting are in many cases tragic in too many of our schools. And the controller can, and in my case will, exercise authority to get those numbers, to put them out and to show what the performance actually is. Thank you very much, Mr. Glazer. Well, let me set as a foundation for my comments, uh, two things. One is, in so many places, I think our teachers are really underpaid. They're such an important job. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we'd all like to pay them more. And the second point would be that I, I don't fault the CTA. They're, they're advocates for their members. I fault the politicians. I fault, I fault the school board members uh, who don't do the right thing. So I don't fault the CTA for being forceful advocates. That's their job, and they, and they do it very well, even when we disagree. But I would point out a couple things now. Number one, I have the legislation in SB 924 that would require all the school districts to provide that data to the controller's office. Uh, they've used a loophole in the law since it was enacted in 2014. And my legislation opposed by the CTA moved out of its first policy committee uh, earlier this year. I think that the controller's office has got to be that place for facts and for open data and would advance that in any way, shape or form that I can. I mentioned earlier in my opening statement about reserve policy. Uh, the CTA had been successful in limiting the reserves that school districts could maintain. I passed legislation in my second year to change that, that policy. I've taken on the CTA on public charter schools, which provide an innovative option in our public education system. I certainly disagree with them about teacher tenure. So I have a long history of, of, of respectful disagreement from a very forceful and strong organization it plays in our political system in, in very impactful ways. But I think that the controller through the data, through the disclosure that that office can provide, can provide the facts for hopefully smarter decisions by our local school districts. Thank you very much, Ms. Yu. Um, yeah, actually, I do agree that um, the teachers are underpaid. And I do talk to a lot of the teachers and then the CTA. And knowing that there's a lot of situations affecting um, the funding of the school. And uh, part of this is also the charter school. And they take away funding from the public school system. And also, um, I did talk to um, the union and understanding, you know, we currently have the budget surplus. And we should actually work on um, helping more of the unions and increase the rage wages. And currently, I'm in a, as a council member of Monterey Park, then we were actually working on increasing wages for a lot of our public employees. And I think inflation is actually a, a, a very big problem right now. And so there's a lot of uh, initiative and a lot of things that we can, as a controller, that we can do. And looking to more of the pension, I wanted to say teacher, they are in the pay, but then uh, what the pension system and also with that match of what um, our future California can afford. So um, I have a lot of um, thinking, a lot of initiative, a lot of investment policies that I would like to help to increase, um, you know, the budget to increase um, the investment return. And hopefully that will help the pension and maintain the way that it is and also be able to raise um, their wages. Uh, following what the inflation rate is. So I must, my strength is investment and I wanted to help in to grow the California economic pie and hopefully it make everyone more income. This is actually my goal and my priorities. Thank you. I wanted to ask all of you about the, um, there there been a number of large uh, contracts awarded on an emergency basis uh, during the pandemic by, by the administration, by the Newsom administration. Uh, a lot of no bid contracts that have 
come under some scrutiny in the media, uh, both for going to some of his campaign contributors and also for not always producing exactly the, the results that were hoped for. Um, I'm wondering whether you think the controller's office dropped the ball on oversight of, of those uh, contracts and, and whether there's uh, anything you would have done differently uh, with regard to those sorts of contracts. Mr. Chen? Yes and yes. Uh, there's no question in my mind that, first of all, as a threshold matter, the use of no bid contracting under the guise of uh, being in a state of emergency is an affront to uh, what I believe is a constitutional and statutory limitation regarding the use of a state of emergency uh, power. Uh, it certainly was the case that we were in a state of emergency, but to have an indefinite extension and for the legislature to not more aggressively check the governor in that regard, I think is a dereliction of duty fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Beyond that though, I would say that, uh, that the controller does have a role in uh, overseeing uh, situations where no bid contracting is happening, where the law explicitly requires competitive contracting or competitive bidding for uh, for the issuance of contracts. There's a separate issue of where the contracts are going, and that's certainly something that the oversight power of the controller can exercise. You know, we, we should give controller E credit for what she did during the SKD Knickerbocker fiasco, which I know this board covered and, and your news team covered as well. Uh, but that was only one example of where a controller could have been more aggressive in looking at contracts where there was either improper legal authority or where legal authority was used in an arguably improper way to, um, to effectuate certain outcomes. So as controller, yes, I would absolutely be aggressive in uh, calling balls and strikes on the use of no bid contracting. There are situations where a no bid contract is appropriate. The vast majority of situations, it frankly, is not. Uh, and the controller has a number of powers up to and including a refusal to pay on the contract when it is issued in contravention of state law or in contra contravention of certain state norms. And so uh, I, I do think this is a role where the controller can be more aggressive and should be more aggressive. And the people of the state of California should benefit from contracting that maximizes both quality as well as quality at a low cost or price point for the people of the state. Thanks. Uh, Senator Glazer, any thoughts on that topic? I, I do. Uh, let me first again establish a little bit of a foundation. You know, I, I've, I've been very uh, tough on the administration during COVID. Uh, your editorial pages and your opinion pages have, have shared my, my thoughts throughout the course of the last couple of years. So I've not been the easy, you know, a cheerleader for everything that the administration has done. But in regard to the no bid contracts, keep this in mind. When you're in a state of emergency, and we have been, with justification, uh, over 80, 89,000 Californians have died, over a million in the country uh, from COVID. This, is, this has been a very serious crisis that the administration has faced. And, I, and what we in the legislature have done is to give him a checkbook. We've given him authorization to try to protect the public health and safety. And he's done that in a way that he thought would, uh, would do, do just that. Now, am I a fan of no bid contracts? Of course not. It goes outside the norms of what we require in our state. But when you're in a state number of emergency, the governor should be given that authority to do what that he or she thinks is best. Now, do I think that um, uh, that we can better protect those contracts going forward? Yes. I mean, there's conversations about conflict of interest uh, and whether or not we should set some standards regarding conflict of interest. And certainly the controller's office is, is in a, a rightful position to provide oversight over every one of those contracts. Uh, if an audit is required to make sure uh, the money was spent correctly, absolutely check the box. If an audit is required to make sure that the contract lives up to the performance standards that have been established, absolutely check the box. Acknowledging that those are after the fact, but there is accountability there and the controller's office plays a part. But in regard to whether or not we should somehow ban no bid contracts, in an emergency, I think, is not the I think the thoughtful approach, uh, given the crisis that, as defined, we would be facing at that point in time. But oversight and scrutiny, absolutely. Thanks, Ms. Yu. Um, yes, actually, um, yeah, I don't agree with the no big contract, and I think it's abused. And if we award to it, I will be, you know, um, hopefully audit and hold the whole process and watching out uh, what the process will be. And so for I came from a private um, investment background. 
that um, we have to have bid and at least, at least three um, to fight for a contract. So I actually look into our city and I would be, I would get really upset if we don't get at least three bids on the contract. So, but then I know during emergency, sometimes, you know, it, you can't really, you know, ask for too much. And so, but then I'm not a big fan of it. And also, I think keeping transparency is so important and no big contract is something that I think is abusive. And also I will watch out for those who get awarded and will be audited at them um, in a closely manner. Thanks, Mr. Galper. Early in the pandemic, uh, I received a phone call from the uh, mayor's office saying, we need a check for $5 million for the purchase of PPE on an emergency basis. I certainly didn't want to be the one to be an impediment to getting absolutely necessary PPE, but I had some questions and they wanted that check within 24 hours. And I said, well, we need to do some checking before we just hand over $5 million on a no bid contract. Uh, I did a little bit of that checking. I was troubled by what it is that I found. I raised that issue with the mayor's office and lo and behold, they found another source who was able to deliver it. Um, for less money and uh, one that did not have the same kind of troublesome history. So sometimes there has to be a balance between getting the payment out and exercising the right controls. After all, a controller is supposed to be controlling and to have those controls in place. You can overdo it and there has to be some flexibility, particularly when it comes to uh, an emergency such as what we had. But there were also tremendous opportunities to buy uh, necessary things through existing contracts, through piggybacking, through some of the purchasing cooperatives without jumping immediately to a no bid contract that also has some real troublesome aspects to it. So I have experience in dealing with exactly this kind of situation and uh, finding that right balance between getting the necessary payments out, but also exercising the controls that are required by the controller's office in terms of protecting the interest of California. So the controller sits on boards of CalPERS and CalSTRS, the state's influential pension funds. What's your position on divesting from fossil fuel companies or otherwise attempting to influence policy through investment decisions? Uh, Mr. Chan, we'll be with you. Sure. And I, I'm going to have to leave after this answer. So I apologize in advance for absenting myself. But my, my general view on these issues is that both CalPERS and CalSTRS exist fundamentally to ensure that the resources that have been set aside and will be set aside for state employees uh, are there and that taxpayers are not put in a position where they have to essentially uh, bail out decisions that are made for a whole host of reasons beyond maximizing return for the people of the state of California. I do believe that there are cases in which uh, divestment is appropriate. There's been recent discussion, for example, about Russian assets, which compose 0.17% of the holdings of CalPERS overall. Uh, you know, in that situation, we can look at, at winding down and doing it in a responsible mm -hmm. way. But as a general matter, uh, I, I don't believe that the that the pension fund should be used as a vehicle for uh, for a form of social experimentation or for more broadly uh, efforts to engage in certain agendas or, or another. I think fundamentally they exist to, as I said, be there to ensure that folks who depend on them and have depended on them will have those resources down the road. Thank you. Senator Glazer. Well, I'll show my bipartisanship by uh, agreeing with much of what uh, Mr. Chen has said. Uh, would I, I like to uh, take our money out of uh, the fund that it goes to Russian? Absolutely. Uh, fossil fuels, you can go through the whole list of social, the social agenda and find lots of things in which you wish uh, they would not uh, invest in. But uh, a controller, when you sit on these boards, you have a fiduciary responsibility for the retirees. I, I take that very, very seriously. And it means that you shouldn't jump on every political platform. Where do you stop? And I think the standard should be uh, an examination of the rate of return um, to ensure that you're protecting those pension funds as you're required to. And if you can make a case that investments in, in fossil fuels is a bad investment, and there are many who might be willing to make that case, uh, then that's something that you should take into account. Um, but I see the issue of divestment as being a smaller part of the bigger challenge facing our retirement boards. Uh, I think the 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 uh, the rate of return that has been inflated over over the past many years to justify uh, certain benefits is an example of really that's the big iceberg under the ocean uh, that that uh, threatens the 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 uh, um, stability 
of those two retirement systems is that they, they they're not balanced in the way they should. Uh, but I get why the issue of the day is this political issue or that. And certainly it's not to it's not to dismiss the importance of climate change and the importance uh, of fossil fuels in that in that conversation. Absolutely. There's no there's no meaning to, to dismiss that. But we're talking about the role of the boards and how they have to handle that fiduciary responsibility. And I agree with our current controller, Betty Yee, who who wrote a letter saying this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, even though, again, I'm sure she and I both agrees about what's happening in Ukraine and what the, the Russian aggression and all the rest. Thank you very much. Ms. Yu. Um, actually, I will say this is my strength because I came from the investment background. So I, first of all, you have to uh, realize the fiduciary duty is what we actually put um, the pension, you know, as our priority, which is put the investment interest, right? The best interest of investors as our priority. So what does that mean is to maximize the return, but at the same time, we have to look into, you know, what is also right for the, the investor is that, for example, fossil fuel. And if we have clean alternative energy and we have fossil fuel, and we have to look into what the return is currently for fossil fuel and alternative energy. So when it comes to a point where the investment returns is exceeds, you know, for um, alternative energy, then we actually should be able to try to exchange, which try to reduce the fossil fuel and actually inject more of the alternative energy. So I wanted to watch it very carefully because that is the right way to do and for our social responsibility. But at the same time, I don't want to jeopardize any fiduciary duties. And same as divesting from Russia, I think we should do it immediately because what happened is you don't want to sell Russia investment after everybody sold because you would be having incur a big loss. So what we need to do for fiduciary duty is we should sell actually before, you know, and keep, you know, the investment return for our pension. So to me is we should call the meeting <clears throat> meeting and actually consider divesting from Russia. I think that is actually an emergency and a priority to do it because if you don't sell, you don't want to sell after everybody sold. And also it really matches the political, um, you know, point of view. And we don't want it to invest more into Russia because they're not, you know, the, the, the good guy, you know, in, in this position. So I wanted to match with what does the fiduciary duty and social responsibility and also the political uh, point of view. And so we wanted to see if we can actually come to the same direction. So to me, I, I'm actually, um, against what Betty Yee mentioned. Um, and I think we should divest from, from Russia. And also I wanted to look into more um, in the future that be able to move it to alternative energy and divest from fossil fuel. Thank you, Mr. Galper. Well, as been mentioned by the others, the uh, primary responsibility of those who are on CalPERS and CalSTRS is that fiduciary responsibility for administrating funds in a manner that will assure prompt delivery of benefits and, and related services. That's the number one goal. Now, I strongly believe, by the way, in our need to transition away from fossil fuels to energy renewable sources. But that is different than saying that we are going to divest. There's uh, always going to be people who do not like one company or one industry or another. Um, if we were to follow all of them, we would be divesting of probably a tremendous number of investments that we have in CalPERS and CalSTRS, and that would not make a lot of sense. Moreover, let me say that while we want to see that transition happen away from fossil fuels and to renewables, um, we also don't want to give up the ability that we have when we uh, have great uh, investments and powers on these boards to influence the votes of these companies. Divestment in and of itself is not going to solve the uh, problem of fossil fuels and move us to renewables, but we can actually exercise our influence as a significant investor. Uh, and let me also note that when we talk about fossil fuels, or for that matter, uh, Russian investments, and by the way, I've also asked from our three pension uh, funds in Los Angeles uh, for a full accounting of uh, so-called Russian investments, and I'm supportive of uh, divestment in them, but exactly what is a Russian investment? Is it a Russian-owned company? Is it owned by oligarchs? Is it a company that has tremendous amount of operations in Russia? These are all questions that are not necessarily simple or easy to answer in one day. It's easy to say we want to divest tomorrow, but we need to actually do our due diligence uh, when it comes to all of these kinds of investments. 
And I think that there is also one last opportunity that should be mentioned, which is CalPERS and CalSTRS have been uh, investing significant amounts of money into new energy sources, into companies that actually have great potential, uh, not just to do good for society, but to do good for the uh, investment portfolio. And that I have been very supportive of. The controller also sits on a couple of committees that um, allocate uh, uh, kind of uh, low cost financing, uh, private activity bonds that are crucial to affordable housing uh, projects. In recent years, there have been some non-housing projects uh, competing for the same financing, uh, such as a train line between LA and Las Vegas, uh, desalination plant. Um, there are those who have argued um, that uh, given the extent of the housing crisis, we should be reserving all this uh, limited financing, uh, low cost financing for affordable housing projects. So. I'm wondering what each of you thinks about that balance, whether you, whether you think it should be reserved for affordable housing projects or whether you uh, would, as a member of those committees, consider some of these other competing uh, projects that are that are that do not provide housing. Um, and we could start with Senator Glazer. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for your question. You know, I. I, you know, I start off with saying, what does the law require? What are the regulations? Um, what are the standards that one has to comply with? And I, I honestly don't know uh, what those are, Josh, to uh, to be able to have that guidepost to kind of answer your question fully. Uh, do I think we have a, a housing crisis in our state? Absolutely. Um, you know, I uh, one of the things I've done in my life was uh, help uh, run the campaign for affordable housing. Uh, a couple billion dollars that the voters uh, eventually passed for affordable housing. So it's been a something that I've worked on, I guess, two, two state bond measures on affordable housing. Um, so it's something I know is a problem and I know the, the value. We had a, uh, a senior low income housing project in our town of Orinda that relied upon uh, some of the low income credits that you are referencing. And so I appreciate how challenging it is to put these packages together. Uh, and where that 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 financing source is an important part of it, but I don't. And so it's a priority. Now, do I know whether the law allows for that type of investment in, in a train from Las Vegas to uh, to L.A. or a desal plan? I I don't know, but I certainly think if there was flexibility in the law, I'd focus on what are the biggest problems that we're facing as a state, and you can't argue with that challenge in the in the area of affordable housing. Thanks, uh, Mr. Galperin. Well, one of the most uh, recent audits that I have performed, and I'm doing it actually on an annual basis, is of a uh, bond measure in Los Angeles uh, called Triple H. You may be familiar with it. Uh, $1.2 billion that was uh, approved by voters for the creation of up to 10,000 permanent supportive housing units passed 10 years ago. Unfortunately, by the way, instead of delivering 10,000 units at this point, it's delivered about 1,400 of them. The average cost is $600,000 a door, and uh, these units are costing up to $837,000 a door. Um, up to seven, uh, on average, uh, funding sources, including monies from uh, 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 tax credits uh, pursuant to the uh, Tax Credit Allocation uh, Committee of the state, which you made mention of, as well as uh, bonds and the uh, Debt Limit Allocation Committee. Um, what I have found, among other things, is that the number of hoops that have to be jumped through um, and the amount of time that it takes and the soft costs associated therewith uh, to be able to actually get these sources of funding is such that the cost of the project gets inflated uh, uh, so much so that it pretty much eats up the benefit that they're getting from the uh, tax credits and from the bonds in many cases. So what we have to do is a holistic look at how these particular committees operate, uh, how they approve of uh, uh, these uh, tax credits and bonds for uh, projects and how we can drive the cost down significantly for affordable housing. So it's not just about uh, uh, making these funds available just for affordable housing, but rather what it is that we're actually getting for that money. Um, I believe there is an appropriate role for tax credits as well as for uh, bonds when it comes to desal, when it comes to trains. But uh, again, it uh, depends on exactly what the uh, terms and conditions are of these committees and of other committees, by the way, that uh, provide various kinds of uh, financing and uh, funding mechanisms as well. 
Uh, and, but the most important thing is not just the amount of money, but what it is that we're getting for that money. And uh, that is something that I will delve into immediately because we're not seeing the results that we should, particularly from these two committees. Thanks, uh, Ms. Yu. Okay. Um, actually, I believe uh, um, everything should be in balance. I don't think we, we serve a lot of the low cost um, financing for just, you know, uh, certain projects or a certain area. So um, I don't, I'm not too familiar with, you know, all the projects that's currently going on, but um, I, to me for affordable housing, I don't want it to, I agree, you know, we should help out in low cost financing to help to build affordable housing. But um, I more cater towards what the market, you know, reflect and help the people to make housing affordable. Um, I rather want to build smaller units instead of, you know, having government subsidize a lot of money and build affordable housing for people. So there's a PPP program, private public partnerships that I think we wanted to encourage is to partner with private developers that develop smaller units for younger families that that will be able for them to afford and so it doesn't jeopardize all the housing around them and because this is a lifetime saving for a lot of people for the housing so um the affordable housing i agree to have certain support but then i don't want it to have uh, all the supports to affordable housing just to jeopardize the current uh, property owners and also instead of helping i wanted to build smaller units so keeping the the square footage and the price low. Um, yeah, so this is my two cents. 